President-elect Joe Biden introduced members of his White House science team on Saturday. This group will help the incoming administration address issues including the pandemic and climate change. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris addressed the importance of working to combat global warming. Our nation's leaders did not listen to the scientists from the start, to raging wildfires, record-breaking storms, and a climate crisis that scientists agree is caused by human beings. The science behind climate change is not a hoax. The incoming administration has already taken steps towards addressing climate change. President-elect Biden has promised to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, and on Friday, he announced that he would make the White House Office of Science and Technology a cabinet-level agency. Some scientists say that this new commitment to the environment is vital as the world is nearing a climate tipping point. For more on this, I want to bring in CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Berardelli. Hey there, Jeff. Good to see you. So polls show that most Americans are, in fact, on board with the president-elect's climate proposals. Seventy-five percent of voters support the U.S. rejoining the Paris Agreement. That includes 55 percent of Republicans. Seventy-two percent support a transition to an all-clean energy economy by the year 2050. If Biden keeps his promises, how will these policies have an impact on climate change? Yeah, so this is huge. Um, Two trillion dollar plan over four years. By far the most ambitious plan of any president. And by the way, uh, the most ambitious plan that we have in the United States, meaning states have their own plans as well, but most of them are not as ambitious as Biden's plan. But it remains to be seen whether or not the Congress is going to pass this. Now, judging by these Yale George Mason numbers, this poll is great for Biden because it shows majority support for climate solutions like renewable energy, 82 percent support for renewable energy. Uh, you know, most people support regulating CO2 as a pollutant in the atmosphere. Um, 86 percent of people support farmers. They want to fund farmers to sequester carbon in the soil and, and make farming more sustainable. So, you know, there's certainly going to be a lot of pressure uh, for Congress to, excuse me, to pass climate legislation. But the question is, is, you know, are Republicans going to be obstructionist or are they going to go along with not only what Biden wants, but also what a lot of their constituents want? Because Republicans do support overwhelmingly uh, renewable energy. So it's interesting, um, even though not everybody agrees uh, on the Republican side, especially that climate change is being caused by human beings, just about everybody believes in most of the solutions to climate change. So it turns out we don't necessarily have to agree on the cause, although it would be nice. Uh, but we generally do agree on the solutions. Well, the year 2020 tied with 2016 for the warmest year on record. You and I have spoken about that a lot. Uh, but given this new information about the incoming administration and what they intend to do, along with what we've seen in climate change, do you expect that 2021 will be on par with 2020 or possibly even warmer? It's not likely. And the reason is we have a La Nina right now. A La Nina is a cool episode in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, we had a La Nina at the end of this past year, which is why it was so incredible that it was able to tie 2016 for the warmest ever. That's because 2016 had a really super El Nino, so a really warm El Nino. So we would have expected a heat record during that year, not this year. And next year, temperatures may go down a bit, but that doesn't really matter much. Ocean temperatures, by the way, we were talking about uh, Earth, land temperatures, and ocean temperatures. When you just look at ocean temperatures, that hit a new record last year. And uh, six of the last six years have been the warmest on record. So, you know, these year-to-year -year variations don't matter very much because the overall trend is, is that way. And I want you to think about it this way. So since the 1800s, we've seen uh, Earth's temperature go up by around two and a quarter degrees. You know, you might not think that's very much, but, you know, very much the Earth operates like our body systems. And if your body temperature went up two and a quarter degrees, that means your fever right now, the Earth is running, is 101 degrees. So think about how you might react to 101 degree temperature. You could still function, but not very well. Well, by the middle of the century, mid to late part of the century, we're looking at 103 degree body temperature. That's when our body systems begin to break down. And that's when the Earth systems really begin to break down. So if you can think about the two as, as very like each other, the, you know, all the um, disparate uh, body systems and, and the same thing with the Earth systems, that's why we're worried about two, three degrees 
four degrees of warming. I really like that analogy, Jeff. All right, uh, I'm wondering if you can go ahead and explain for our viewers the climate tipping point uh, and what will happen if we don't start to strongly address climate change right now? So first of all, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen because there is no precedent for this. To give you an idea of how fast we are warming the earth right now, it's 100 times faster than, we were in the, than when we were in the last ice age, coming out of the last ice age. That's how quickly the earth is warming right now. So we know a few things. Sea level is gonna rise you know, at least two to three feet by the end of the century, possibly or maybe probably more than that. That means hundreds of millions of people will have to evacuate or leave uh, coastal communities and move inland. So we know there's gonna be a big climate migration crisis. We also know for certain that a lot of parts of the earth are gonna become uninhabitable because of how hot they are and how dry and desertified they become. That means a lot of people are not gonna be able to grow food anymore. They're gonna lose their livelihoods. They will have to migrate. That's gonna cause international security crises. But what we don't know is, you know, there's tremendous biodiversity loss. There was a paper that just came out a couple of days ago, 17 of the top scientists in the world, warning of a ghastly future, saying that even experts can't quite wrap their head around how bad it's going to be, that things are going to be worse. And by the time we realize just how bad they are, it's going to be too late. So there are just some things that we don't know how the Earth system and all of its different systems are going to react and interact with each other and how humans with a population right now of 7 billion but you know in the next couple of decades of, of 10 billion people maybe more by the end of the century how all of that is going to work out honestly we, there is no precedent to measure it against the bottom line is that we're doing things you know that we're like guinea pigs in an experiment and we're doing things that have never really happened uh, in, in hundreds of thousands really millions of years so I guess we'll find out if we don't address it seriously. That's why it's so important that we really start to get serious. The good news is, is that climate solutions are, are accelerating really quickly. The price of solar and wind is, is less than fossil fuels right now. It's creating tons of jobs in middle America. So for many reasons, things are looking better for us, but we have to get real serious, and that means some real policy within the next couple of years. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. You're welcome.